Welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. If you're an ambitious woman who wants to advance in leadership, then this podcast is for you. This podcast is co-hosted by Nikki Barua, digital innovator, serial entrepreneur, author, and speaker, and Monique Marquez, senior corporate leader, ex-Googler, and diversity expert. From inspiring stories to cutting edge strategies, you'll learn how to develop the skill set, mindset, and tool set to get future ready fast and accelerate your success. Hi, I'm Monica, your host for today's episode. Are you passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion? Do you courageously say something when you see something happening to you or others that just doesn't feel right? Or do you feel yourself shying away from it because you don't know what to do in those moments? How would you like to learn some game-changing strategies that you can implement to help disrupt unconscious and systemic bias? Our guest, Stacey Gordon, CEO and Chief Diversity Strategist of Rework Work, shares how her journey was led by her passion for diversity, equity, and inclusion. After an experience in the corporate world, Stacy decided that she didn't want to perpetuate the cycle of bad practices that she had witnessed and decided to strike out on her own and work on implementing diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies at companies holistically. In her role as executive advisor and diversity strategist, she coaches and counsels executive leaders on DEI strategies for the business while offering a no-nonsense approach to education for the broader employee population. Taking a 360 degree of work, Stacy is the creator of the second most viewed course on LinkedIn learning and has surpassed the milestone of having reached more than a million unique learners. In this episode, Stacy shares her insights on identifying your passion and purpose, navigating systemic biases, and her framework for addressing microaggressions. Stacy is also a repeat best-selling author, recently releasing Unbias: Addressing Unconscious Bias at Work which is a must-have resource for all employers, managers, and HR professionals seeking to create and sustain healthy, inclusive, and equitable workplace environments. Visit imbeyondbarriers.com where you'll find show notes and links to all the resources in this episode, including the best ways to get in touch with Stacy. Welcome, Stacey. Thank you so much for joining us on the Beyond Barriers podcast. We are thrilled to have you here, and I know our listeners are in for a treat. Um, So tell us a little bit about who is Stacey and your journey, and um, just a little bit about what you're doing today. Thank you. Um, So I am Stacey Gordon, and I am the founder, the CEO, executive advisor, chief diversity strategist, uh, you know, (laughs) with Rework Work. And my company uh, got that name because of the work that we do, which is really all about looking at companies holistically and looking at the places that we need to rework, you know, looking at recruiting and hiring and onboarding and, um, you know, really their diversity, inclusion, Mm -hmm. equity strategies. And so um, we are in a place where we're spending a lot of time working with CEOs and their executive teams on um, reworking or creating in some places (laughs) the strategy (laughs) around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that really is where a lot of our focus is today. Fantastic. And so tell me a little bit about, um, you know, how did you identify, like, you know, or get clarity around your passion around, you know, diversity, equity and inclusion? You know, did you uh, set out saying this is what I want to do? Or was it something that you realized there was a gap and and chose to pursue it? Tell us a little bit about that. How was that journey for you and identifying your passion? Yeah, the the journey for me has been, um, you know, the clarity came when I was working as a recruiter. So I worked, um, I started working as an external recruiter. And I did that because my goal was to work with, you know, large companies, I was working with them in a number of other capacities, Mm -hmm. helping women to get hired. Mm -hmm. Um, Like that was my role. I actually was the executive director for the National Association of Women in in, uh, Women MBAs, Mm -hmm. and um, all the clients I was working with, I said, you know, I would love to just work within your organization. And they all said, Stacey, you're so great at what you do. You'd be an excellent diversity recruiter, Mm -hmm. but we can't hire you as a diversity recruiter because we have so many other recruiters in our in our. 
company and we only have you know one diversity recruiter and we can't hire an external person we have to promote one of those individuals so you'd have to start as a recruiter and then work your way into a diversity recruiter and i'm like but you just told me i would make an excellent diversity <laughs> recruiter at your job so now you're telling me i actually have to do something else first before i can get the role and then you're telling me that oh you can't hire me as a recruiter because i haven't had the official title of recruiter with another company prior mm -hmm. so actually everything that you're telling me is complete bs right exactly <laughs> <laughs> wow so so i, I started say, you know it's funny that you know our worlds probably did cross paths because I used to be the head of diversity recruiting at Goldman Sachs uh, internally. And we used to partner with uh, the National Association for Women MBAs. I think they've changed their name now, but um, so you, they did, they changed it, they changed it back. Yeah. So, <laughs> so but you know, it, it, it makes sense in the sense of your passion of helping women, you know, um, you know, get into the workforce. Can you share a little bit about what you learned that what do you feel like held women back outside of the systemic biases and the things that we know that like the bias that you find in the recruiting process, et cetera. But what do women do that sometimes they trip themselves up and hold themselves back that you wish you could share with our listeners? You know, what a lot of what women, and I, I only want to say what women do. I think a lot of pe people in general do this. Mm -hmm. but I think women fall into the trap more often um, because we are socialized to not step up and take risks, to not, um, mm. you know, reach out and try something new. And so then we end up doubting ourselves and we doubt just how good we are at what we do. And so I, I'll, I'll never forget, I tell the story all the time um, of a woman when I was recruiting who I reached out to her because she was excellent at what she did. And I needed somebody who specifically um had experience with a, a, a software mm -hmm. and um and she was the person in her role who was training everybody in her company how to use it she was the go-to person for this software so we get on the phone i'm doing a quick phone screen and i say hey you know let's call her Anne. uh you know i just said rate yourself from one to ten in your ability to use this software i'm expecting her to say 10 and we'll move right. on uh -huh. and she goes mm, maybe a six Really? <laughs> and she's so teaching like, others. Yeah. <laughs> right. So then I paused because I was like, wait, what? So because I was expecting 10 and we would just keep going, right? Like, yeah. and then my brain heard six and I was like, what? I, I don't understand. So she keeps talking, right? Talking about what she does. And I'm not listening to her. Mm -hmm. I'm just hearing in my head six. And then I'm thinking, did I misread her, her resume? Is this the, did I call the right person? Maybe it's not her. Maybe like I'm going through all these things in my head. And then finally I pick up her resume, I look at it again, and I had to just tell her, I was like, Anne, stop, stop talking. I said, could you back up a minute? I said, do you know how to use this software? She said, yes. I said, how long have you been using it? She goes, 10 years. I said, are you the go-to person in your company that teaches everybody else how to use it? Uh -huh. I said, yes. I said, so you are the number one person who knows how to use the software, right? She's like, yes. I said, so then why the hell, when I asked you <laughs> to rate yourself from one to 10, would you give me a six? And she goes, oh, did I do that? Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, we don't even know how we we short sell ourselves or we second yeah. guess and we and I told her in that moment, I said, OK, we're going to start over. I said, I'm going to act like I didn't hear the first part of what you told me and we're just going to start again. And she was like, oh, my goodness, thank you so much for telling me that. She goes, I can't believe I said that. She's like, why would I say that? I was like, I don't know. I said, I almost hung up on you. <laughs> 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 wow, that's fantastic. And I'm, I'm so glad you shared that story because I think what will resonate is that, you know, we do sometimes underestimate our value and we don't articulate our unique value proposition the way that we should. Um, so that leads me to my next question in, you know, the courage around taking risks or, you know, putting your, raising your hand or putting your name in the hat for the role that maybe when you look at the job description, you only check, you know, seven of the 10 things that they're asking for. Um, and research has shown, and I'm sure you as a former recruiter and working with, you know, lots of um, underrepresented groups, 
We tend to opt out because we don't check the boxes like on all 10. But I've seen more than my share of colleagues, male colleagues to the right and the left of me who will say, oh, yeah, I checked four or five of these. I'll figure out the rest. Yeah, I'm going to go for the job. And then they get it. Um, And so, can you tell me a little bit about how you've coached other people or what you tell um, individuals, like you said, as a recruiter, how do they... How do they move forward and take that risk and take a role that maybe is stretch for them and um, and get the job and land the job? Yeah. So I, the, I think the number one thing I tell them is don't tell yourself no before somebody else has. Right. Like give them the opportunity to say no, but don't discount yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do that far too often. Um, and the other aspect is you've got to you got to get your girls right. <laughs> you have you've got to have your tribe of people who are going to have your back. And so, right. just recently, I had a friend who was going for a job. Um, I was actually with a, a, a top notch, you know, reputable company. It was a really high level position, mm-hmm. and I nominated her for the job. And she goes, "Oh, thank you so much." She goes, "But I just don't know that I that would be me." I said, "No, no." no. I, <laughs> Why would I nominate you for the job if I didn't think you could do it? I'm like, just right. go for the job. So she goes, she got, you know, second interview, third interview. She ended up ultimately not getting the job. But every time I talked to her along the way, she was like, I just don't know if this is a job for me. And I kept telling her, it doesn't matter. It was like anything that you were struggling with, one of us knows how to help you. We will right. find resources. We will get you what you need. You will not be alone in this job. Mm-hmm. So I was like, stop second guessing yourself and just go get the damn job. So, uh, you know, the the advice is have your tribe of people who are going to be there, who will help you with the answer. You might not have the answer, Mm -hmm. but somebody else will. And somebody else will, if they don't have it, they'll go get it for you, right? There's always somebody that's going to be willing uh, to help. You know, that's such fantastic advice. And that brings me to, you know, the power of community. Like you said, you have to have your tribe or your circle of, you know, advocates or your board of directors or people who are really going to help you level up. And, you know, we here at Beyond Barriers truly believe that, you know, you level up together with, um, you know, a tight knit, you know, community of individuals. And women tend to, from what I've seen, is we don't leverage our community the way that we should in terms of really asking for help. Um, And like you said, you may have an area of expertise that I don't have, and I should ask you and leverage you to help me figure that out, opposed to trying to figure it out on my own. Um, Can you share, you know, how did you find, you know, what is the key to building these types of long lasting relationships that you, that would, that help you level up? Like what have you done in the past to get access to an influential tribe? I think part of it is um, building that community that comes from like professional associations and networks, right? Mm -hmm. It usually starts there. um, And then out of that network, you'll kind of create a smaller circle. Mm -hmm. um, And it's just that we ha- we have to be better about maintaining it, right? Mm-hmm. It's so easy to be like, I have kids, I have a spouse, mm-hmm. I've got my work, I've got these other things going on. And when people are getting together for, you know, whatever, birthdays, drinks, uh, baby shower, we don't go, right? Mm-hmm. We might send a gift and, and a note of regret. Um, <laughs> And we, we have to be better about building that community. We don't have to be chained to our homes. We get to leave mm-hmm. and go and create those relationships because, you know, when the guys want to go uh, drink beer or play golf or whatever it is that they do, <laughs> right, they don't stop to think, well, my daughter has a project that's due tomorrow. I should probably stay home and help her with it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And so we have to stop. Um, I have three daughters. And so I am guilt ridden all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I have made a concerted effort to to go anyway, right? Mm-hmm. To leave. And I've also realized that in my absence, they learn to figure it out on their own as well. Mm-hmm. And I'm empowering my girls to stop waiting for me to help them with everything. Right. Um, so that that's also part of it is that you've got to maintain those um, those friendships and those connections 
um, because doing that is what will help to grow it because we'll always connect you with somebody else, right? You might start with two connections, but then, right. Um, and there'll be another person. And I'll also add just, you know, I was really deliberate about growing my network. The way that I did it was um, I used to do uh, a, a brunch every um, March for, oh. for Women's History Month. Uh -huh. And I would just invite all the really cool women that I knew. And, uh -huh. um, and I would tell them, invite somebody cool that you know, that we should know. And so we would just bring in, you know, there'd be th two or three new people every year. And it slowly just grew. Uh -huh. And out of that, people would make connections. They would usually, you know, business connections, client connections, customer connections. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just been really helpful. Fantastic. And, you know, I think like you said, of, of uh, continuously growing your network, because I think one of the lessons that I learned is that, you know, sometimes the mentoring, the network, the individuals, you know, who are there to help you out, you can outgrow them. They'll always remain your friends, strong relationships. But how do you know, like you said, always adding really new, new people, cool people, people that really kind of fascinate you or, or cause you to level up as well. Um, so I loved how you said, you know, constantly growing your network and being strategic in that and that there's no nothing wrong in there as long as you are being genuine and developing a relationship and nurturing that relationship as a relationship should be. Um, I think that's fantastic advice. So I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about, um, you know, you were talking about how you you did a, quite a bit of work in the recruiting space. You you know, you're a DEI expert now who is you know about to release a book. Um, I think it's called Unbiased. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. But help me understand, like, how did you set and achieve those professional goals? How did you you know go from I'm doing these types of things, but now I'm going to you know become the entrepreneur, launch my own you know company, and I'm going to write a book, which is a huge feat. Um, break that down for us. Like, what tips can you share on being able to execute on those goals? I think first you have to have goals, right? <laughs> yeah, you have to have a North Star. Um, yeah. You've got to be clear about what they are and, um, and understanding that you can reach them. Because sometimes we set goals and we think, oh, I don't know if I'll be able to do that. Or, you know, mm -hmm. who am I to really, uh, I don't know if that's going to that's going to work. Right. And so again, we're shutting ourselves down before we've even attempted the thing. Right. So um, for me, going from recruiting into DEI, you know, when I was in recruiting, I considered myself a diversity recruiter, right? It was right. just all about diversity. Um, but what I realized was, and the reason I actually got out of recruiting was because the clients just, I, I couldn't, I couldn't stomach being part of that cycle where I was perpetuating the bad practices and procedures and um, the barriers that were um, were put in place. Right. And I was like, somebody has to dismantle the barriers. Right. So, and I was like, I can't do that as a recruiter. Mm -hmm. And so what I actually did was strategically, I took a job as a uh, diversity and, uh, inclusion project manager in a talent acquisition team. Mm -hmm. So leverage my recruiting expertise uh, to get into DNI and really see how companies were doing it internally, mm -hmm. and when I saw that, I was like, "Oh, okay, this should be no problem because y'all don't know what you're doing." <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Okay, I was like, I thought these companies, these large organizations, you know, had all the answers, and then I got inside and realized, no, they don't. <laughs> right. So it was really helpful to me, right, to be able to see um, what my customer, right? What my potential client would look like, what they were, oper how they were operating, what their barriers were. Right. Um, and so that helped me with the confidence then to do what I needed to do um, to work from exclusively from the angle of, of DEI. Right. Yeah. And in terms of the book, I mean, it's always been something I do so much speaking, right? right. Everyone always asks, well, do you have a book? And it's always, no, I don't. <laughs> and so it took years. Um, I just, I'm, I'm a very much an efficient person and I, I don't like to do things unnecessarily. And I was like, I am not writing a stitch of this book until I have a publisher. <laughs> right, right. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so I just kept searching and searching and reaching out, leveraging my network, talking to different people, and eventually got connected uh, with somebody at Wiley who said, yeah, that's a fantastic idea. Write the book. And so fantastic. I wrote the book. <laughs> 
Well, congratulations. I'm excited for that to come out. And we'll we'll talk a little bit more about it when we wrap up. But I do want to ask a question um, in, you know, this current environment, right? COVID has displaced a lot of women of color in, in jobs and in also trying to get them to kind of get back into work um, and also acclimating to remote work and just all of the disruption that the digital age has, has um, caused. What advice or what have you done? Like, how are you, were you impacted in any way? And how did you have to be agile and shift and adapt to things that changed overnight? Like, how, how did you remain successful in that regard? I mean, I have to say, I was going to say I was lucky, but my favorite phrase is luckiest of the prepared. And so I will say I was prepared, right? right. Um, I, we had literally, before the pandemic, just bought like brand new laptop and, and computer for the kids. We had just upgraded our, um, uh, our uh broadband. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we had a, we had just bought a new printer because the old one wasn't working properly. Right. I had just set up a home office, you know, so we just had all these things. And then the pandemic hit and it was like, oh, well, it's all here already. Ready to go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and the work that we do with clients, we were doing um, hybrid, right? We were doing some in-person sessions with clients and we were doing some um, using Zoom. So right. we had already been set up on Zoom. We knew what to do. We had our accounts going. We were using that system prior. So it was actually frustrating for us to have so many people on Zoom. It was like, get off our bandwidth. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> because we were already used to doing it because we had, you know, international clients. Um, and a lot of that work was being done remotely through Zoom. So in that way, we really didn't have to prepare, right? We, we had already set the stage for everything that we needed to do. Um, but you know, you you do have to. We did have to uh, pivot a little bit. We, you know, change hours up a little bit with the, the kids being at home and bandwidth issues and things like that. Um, and and I know that for some, it hasn't been that easy, right? They right. they have been in a space where maybe they they didn't have enough you know technology for all the kids, right. didn't have the broadband that they needed, or didn't have internet at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so, for those, um, it is I think. We always find a way though, right? right? We always find a way to soldier through to make sure the kids don't go without <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and to, to get them what they need. And so I think that in the same way that we um, advocate for others and we mm -hmm. advocate for our kids, we've got to do the same for ourselves, right? We've got to turn that the advocacy um, inward and be able to make sure that we're not leaving ourselves behind. What if you could pinpoint the invisible ceilings limiting your success? Imagine having clarity on your strengths and barriers so you can take action and gain unstoppable momentum to advance as a future ready leader. Well, that's exactly what the Beyond Barriers quiz will help you discover. You'll get your personalized score based on the 25 essential elements proven to accelerate success in the digital age, so you can understand what's holding you back and where to focus your efforts. The Beyond Barriers quiz is completely free and takes just a few minutes. Go to imbeyondbarriers.com slash quiz and take the quiz today. I love that. I love what you said in terms of the whole self-advocacy, um, because I truly believe and, you know, with the clients that I work with, with um, young women who are kind of moving up in their career, also teaching them. And you can probably give some insight on this, because like you said, you went into the belly of the organization to understand what were, you know, what were some of the systemic biases, all of these types of things, the unconscious bias that you see playing out in various different processes, be it promotion, be it hiring, all of those types of things. What would you, you know, what advice would you give to um, young women looking to move up in their career that you and I both know that as much as we are fighting this, um, you know, the systemic bias and trying to, you know, create awareness around it, that it's not going to go away overnight. Um, how do you, you know, what's the advice that you give that to help people not fall victim to those systemic biases and learn how to navigate around them, over them, through them? Um, what, you know, what word of advice would you give them in terms of, you know, when you start feeling that burnout, like what keeps you going? Yeah, I think um, 
You know, at first, you know, I interpreted your question a, a different way. So I'm going to answer it two ways. Yes. Because I think part of that is, is don't take the first no, right? Mm, and, yes. and ask for receipts. <laughs> I <laughs> love that, yes. <laughs> when somebody says, um, no, I don't think you're ready for X, Y, Z role, or no, I don't think you're ready for this role because it involves travel. Mm-hmm. You need to get a why, right? I'm like, I need, I need a reason. I need a concrete answer for this, right? Mm-hmm. When somebody says, um, you know, you didn't get the promotion, I need concrete answers. I need what is my feedback. Mm-hmm. I don't want to hear, you know, you'll get it next time. No, okay, well, what stopped me from getting it this time? Yes. I need to know so that I have tangible things that I can go back and work on. If I don't have tangible from you, then you probably don't have a real reason. Right. And so you have to keep pushing and make people tell you why you're not getting the thing that you very well know that you deserve to get. <laughs> that is fantastic. I love that. Get receipts. The receipts are the why. <laughs> yeah. You, the people, you know, cause it's so easy for people to say, well, you know, you just weren't the right fit this time. What does that mean? Exactly. Yes. I hate that word. You're not the right fit. <laughs> hey, say, get clear. Give me actionable feedback, right? And you can say that. Mm-hmm. I need actionable feedback. Thank you very much. Can you give me something that I can actually go work on so that when I show you that I have made progress in this thing that you, is actionable, I'm then going to get the thing that you tell me I can't have today, but that I'll get tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love that. So I think that that is just, it's, it's, I realize that that's part of it is we don't get the feedback Mm -hmm. that is needed because sometimes you're not ready. Right. But you're not told what makes you ready. Mm -hmm. And so what are you supposed to work on and how are you supposed to improve and how are you supposed to be ready the the next time? Exactly. Or the other words I hate is that, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. You're on the right track. It's like, okay, but right. I'm, I'm, what does that mean? My will's here. (laughs) Right. What track, which track am I on? Yes. Yes. (laughs) And, and and what does that look like? And where does this track lead to? Because right now it looks like this track is going nowhere. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Right. It's like an eternal track I'm on. It's like a hamster wheel. I love that. And and I think in terms of burnout, you know, um, even the, the, the word burnout always drives me nuts too, because it's like, we we all have to work, right? Yes. There's all things that we have to work towards. I think you get burnt out when you are working towards something that you don't think you can achieve, mm-hmm. right? Um, I think of like wheels spinning, right? On a car, mm-hmm. the tires, anything. Yeah. And so why are you working towards something you don't think you can achieve? If you don't think you can achieve it, it's either because you actually can't achieve it or because you think you can't achieve it. So one of those two things has to change, right? Right. If you don't think you can achieve it, why is that? Change Mm -hmm. your mindset and then go get the thing you want. And if you've been told and you know you can't get it where you are, you need to change and you need to leave and you need to go get it someplace else, Mm -hmm. right? But don't sit in burnout because that's just completely your... um, extending energy for absolutely no reason, right? It's just waste. (laughs) Right. It's kind of the unrealistic goal. Okay. Well, if that's your goal, how do you break it down and, you know, figure out like what it is you need to do so you can level up and get there. And if it's not going to happen there, I love what you said, like then make a change and go somewhere else where you can get more traction. Yeah. And it might be in a different department, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it might not be changing jobs altogether or changing the company right. altogether, mm-hmm. but, you know, start looking and looking for the, the people who um, actually have your back and want to help you in your career. Mm-hmm. One of the questions I get all the time, and I think, you know, very few people would probably be able to answer it, but I trust you would. Um, you know, I get it all the time and and I have, you know, I have my coaching techniques, but I have young women say, listen, when I um, am, you know, on the wrong end of a microaggression or, or micro inequity, how do I address it? Um, you know, because if I stay silent, then it just festers and I'm the only one who suffers. But, you know, how do you address and call out and hold somebody accountable uh, for, you know, the um, implicit, you know, comment or sometimes explicit comment that they overhear or something? How would you, how do you coach people to address those things? Yeah, that's um. It's interesting that you ask that because we. I, I always say we. I don't know why I always say we. I am just very inclusive. <laughs> I love it. Yes. Um, 
But I, there's a, a framework that I use, and it's actually in the book, um, that really talks about um, how, how you do this, right? And you start, the, the framework is pause, right? Mm-hmm. P-A-U-S-E. The P is process. Because the first thing you kind of have to do is process what you're feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, because sometimes, you you know, somebody says something to you, and it kind of gets under your skin. And you've got to stop and ask yourself, like, do I want to respond to this? Is it something I need to respond to? Mm-hmm. Um, and what I find is that it takes us a little while to process. Mm-hmm. And then we think that the um, the time has passed and we can no longer discuss it. It's like, oh, shoot, I missed my window of opportunity. Right. I could have addressed it right then and I didn't. So, dang, nothing I can do about it. And that's not true, right? Mm-hmm. You can come back to a conversation uh, a couple of days later and say, you know, we had a meeting and you said X and that made me feel a certain kind of way, or I wanted to, to check for understanding. So the A in pause is to ask, right? Ask if you heard correctly, repeat what you thought you heard mm-hmm. and ask for clarification before you respond. Cause sometimes we hear what we want to hear. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. And that isn't really what the person said. I know I get misquoted all the time. I'm like, I did not say that. <laughs> right. Right. At no point was that, did that come out of my mouth? Right. Mm-hmm. So people will put their own intentions on your words. Mm-hmm. Um, and so asking, you know, to, to repeat what was heard and then understand what they're trying to com- convey. Mm-hmm. So you want to understand their, their motivation and assume positive intent. Yes. Uh, because a lot of times what they're trying to say is something positive. They just, you know, have foot and mouth disease and, right. <laughs> <laughs> kind and of don't way, really yeah. know. Yeah. Like, <laughs> how to get it across properly. Um, and then you want to share, you want to share how it impacts you. So mm-hmm. it, it, it share your impact um, or your perspective on that comment and say, you know, when you said that, it made me feel this way mm-hmm. or that I didn't necessarily um, agree with that take because of whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And then you've got to explore ways that you can reframe that statement. So they're not going to make the same mistake again. Right. So right. really discussing with them, like, okay, I get where you were trying to come from, but maybe next time, you know, you might want to try this. Fantastic. I love that. Pause. I think I will tell you right now, I think that is probably the best ex- explanation or like lesson that I've ever heard someone talk about. How do you address it? Because it, it, I think pause every single one of the um, steps you went through also helps alleviate the possibility of playing into preconceived stereotypes of like the, you know, the, um, the, the hot, <laughs> you know, the hot Latina, like, because I'm, I'm also, I'm very, I'm, I always get it all the time. I'm loud. I can like when I get animated or I get upset. Um, and so if I just pause and I listen to all of those things then I don't play into that stereotype as well um, and, and cause people to get defensive. And just the, the, you know, the word, the acronym itself, pause, causes you to pause and then go through that whole process. So I think that is fantastic, Stacey. And I'm telling you right now, I'm going to borrow that and I will certainly give you credit for it. But I think that is the best example of how well, to it's in the book. So awesome. awesome. <laughs> yes. Well, I will be a huge proponent of telling people read the book, but I'm going to tell you the pause, uh, you know, the pause story because Stacy, you've, you've kind of framed it. The framework is just phenomenal. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I will, that's my new answer. Anytime I get that, that is going to be my new answer is your framework. I think it's fantastic. Um, so you. that said, you know, your book is coming out, um, you know, share with our audience, like, you know, how can they, how can they get it? And, um, you know, and how can they stay in contact with you? Because we get that all the time of like, I love this. How can I get more? Um, so how can someone, you know, get more of the goodness that you have to share? Yes. Um, so you can find me. My website is reworkwork.com. Um, it's easy to find everything from there. Mm-hmm. But um, the book, the book is available. It's Unbiased, Addressing Unconscious Bias at Work. And you can find it at Unbiased Book. It's a shortcut, uh, but it still takes you to the Rework Work website. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, you can find the book on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Bookshop, uh, Goodreads. It's um, all of your favorite independent booksellers. Um, it is on all the shelves. So that's great. Um, 
And if you buy it on Amazon, um, I believe it's shipping. Like everyone who has pre-ordered, it's already they've already got it. So that's great. Oh wow! Um, I need and, to get on that. So I will definitely get my copy. That's fantastic. <laughs> and I, I've been told it's a good, fast read. Right? Mm-hmm. I am one of those people. I cannot stand reading long books. Yes. I, can, I, I don't want it to be long and arduous. And it's just it's a quick. Um, it really is reflective of me. <laughs> <laughs> Get to the point. Hi, D. Yeah. You go. <laughs> and, and people who have read it so far, who are friends of mine, they've said, oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's like listening to you talk. Like it's fantastic. <laughs> so it's like we can become your best friend. So it's like, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, you know, we love to ask all of our podcast guests to leave our, you know, listeners with, you know, some a parting pearls of wisdom of, you know, how do they continue to accelerate their success or anything that you feel will be um, useful for them in continuing their pursuit of success? I think it's, it's part, you know, con- first of all, continuing the pursuit. Um, mm-hmm. We stop, we give up, we say it's too hard, or we have wanted to do it, but we haven't actually tried yet. And then we say it's too late, right? Um, yeah. There's a quote that says, a year a year from now, you'll wish you started today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I love that one because it's so true. We, we put off all the time. Oh, I can't, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And, and I just think we just have to start, just start the thing. Mm-hmm. It's going to be cruddy. It's going to be an awful first draft, whatever it is you're trying yes. to do. But just start it, right? And if you start it, you, it's going to get easier and easier and you'll perfect it along the way. But if you never start, you are going to live a life of regret. And I think that that's the worst thing you could possibly do. <laughs> that is very great. I mean, just a great word of advice in terms of just continue the pursuit. But I love that. I love that. It's always true, right? When you finally get to do something and you think about, oh, like I should have just, like, that was easy or it wasn't as hard as I thought it. I should have just done it last year. Where would I be now? Um, right. So- and that is usually the big thing is that it's not as hard. We build up this thing in our head that it's going to be so awful and so <laughs> hard. And we're going to hate it so much. And it's just not going to work. And all these things. And then you finally do the thing and you're like, well, dang, I could have done that. Like, forever ago. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, Stacy, thank you so much for your time. I know that you are super busy, especially with your book launch in the next couple of days. So I appreciate you taking the time and sharing your pearls of wisdom and your insight and your, you know, just your um, very tangible advice with our listeners. And I look forward to reading your book and um, staying in touch. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. This was a great conversation. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Beyond Barriers podcast. There are thousands of podcasts out there, and we are so grateful that you've chosen to listen to ours. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and tell a friend about it and subscribe to get new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Visit IamBeyondBarriers.com where you'll find show notes, links, and the best way to connect with our guests. See you next episode.